Okay, hi there, welcome to my channel. And today, today we're gonna take a look at language models are unsupervised multitask learners paper, also known as GPT-2, which gained a lot of recognition, not only because of its abilities, but also the way it was released to the public. I also gonna present the key ideas of the paper, the comparison between the GPT-1 and GPT-2, take a look at the data sets, it's been trained on, the results is achieved, and some of the details when it comes to architecture and the way they tokenize the inputs. So yeah, without further ado, let's dive into it. So the main point of GPT-1 was to was the idea of self-supervised learning. So we pre-trained the model on 7,000 books before and gains the understanding of the language and then we fine-tune it for certain tasks. So in this case we so self-supervised learning allows us to not use so much of a label data and not train model for every specific task separately we you just pre-train it and then fine-tune. Okay so that's that was the core idea. So in this paper they actually take a slightly different approach and they do only generative pre-training on a much larger data set and they actually evaluate it in, in a zero shot configuration. So basically they don't do any fine-tuning. So let's look at the abstract. They say that natural language processing tasks such as question answering, machine translation, reading, comprehension and summarization are typically approached with supervised learning on task-specific data set. We demonstrate that language models begin to learn this task without explicit supervision when trained on a new data set of million web pages called web text. And I think that that's the core idea of the paper. The capacity of the language model is essential to the success of zero-shot task transfer and increasing it improves performance in a log linear fashion across tasks. Our largest model, GPT-2, uh, is a 1.5 billion parameter transformer that achieves state-of-the-art results on seven out of eight tested language modeling datasets in a zero-shot setting, but still undefeats. So that's interesting, we're gonna get into it. And GPT-2 comparing to GPT-1 has um, 10, 10 times more parameters. So in the previous one it was 7,000 books. This time they tried to get the data from the internet. So they used common crowd but it turns out that the quality of the data was really poor. So they created a new web scrape which emphasized document quality. So essentially they scraped all outbound links from Reddit and which received at least free karma. So free karma is like free likes. And this can be thought as a heuristic indicator for whether other user found the link interesting, educational or just funny. So the web text contained the text subset of 45 million links, which they, um, after cleaning, it's contained 8 million of documents for a total of 40 gigabytes of text. So this is a huge, massive data set. And also when I was talking that they haven't released the model, this is the one indicator that the results that they had is really hard to get because obviously they build their own web scrape and the data set they have, it's not wildly available. So it's also make it harder to replicate those results. So yeah, when they got the data set, obviously they need to tokenize it. They used byte pair encoding and I haven't described it in a previous video in GPT-1. If you haven't watched it, I really recommend it. But I'm gonna do it right now. So um, basically we can tokenize it we can, there's a free way to tokenize the um, input we've got. So we can do a word-based tokenization. So we uh, basically give an index for each word that we get. But in this fashion, we go, we end up with the large, really large vocabulary. But obviously we got the limited space for vocabulary. A lot of words end up as an unknown token because they occur like once. So another method of tokenization is character base. So obviously we got small vocabulary because number of tokens is equal to the number of letters in the alphabet, but the single character doesn't have any meaning. Only the configuration of characters like word carry some sort of meaning. So the sub word based approach is a combination of two and this is what byte per encoding is. So let me show you how it works. So for example, let's say we've got the, the word geologist and so first of all we do, so we split it into pairs. So you've got G-E-E-O-O-L and so on. And then what we do is we create a dictionary where we calculate how many of these pairs occur in, a, in our data set. So in this case, we end up with the 
one value for each pair. But when we pass the next word, which is pianist, again we split it, got our pairs, and we update our dictionary. So in this case, we see some of these pairs are occurring again, right? So since, since we only got two examples here, we use this dictionary, but obviously you do this process, you repeat that process for each word in your, in your dataset. So obviously in this case, we only got two examples, but normally you create this dictionary for each word in your dataset. So next, what we do, we take a dictionary, we extract the pairs with the highest occurrence. So in our case is ISST. We convert to convert them to the subwords and add it to the vocabulary. So in this case, we increase the vocabulary and we basically repeat that process till we get the desired size of the vocabulary. So if you think about it, we have words. We, we, in this case, we can combine, we can create the subwords like ing, which are indicators of the um, verbs. So yeah, this is the method they use. It's pretty simple, actually. In this case, the desired size of the vocabulary is 50,257 subwords. So that's the uh, byte pair encoding. When it comes to the architecture, the they slightly different uh, difference they do is they use layer normalization was moved to each subblock and they add the layer normalization after the final self-attention block. So this is how it looks like for GPT-1. And they just add layer normalization here. So the architecture itself uh, didn't change much. Only the, the size and the amount of data they put into it has changed. And as you can see also, they presented four models. Um, so the first model is, has the same parameters as the GPT-1. So they also presented the medium, large, and this mega model, GPT-2. Um, when it comes to architecture, they also used uh, context size. They increased it to 1024 and large part batch size of 512 is used. Okay, now we can actually look at the results they, they achieved. So as I said before, they achieved seven state-of-the-art results out of eight data sets. And these are only language modeling tasks. Language modeling tasks mainly are based on the predicting the next word in the sentence or in the whatever text you pass into the model. So first of all, we got the Lambada um, data set. Let me show you how it looks like. So Lambada is testing the ability to find the long-term dependencies. And this is the one of the examples. So we got the context, which is a part of the text from the book. Then they have a target uh, sentence and it needs to predict the last word of the sentence. So in terms of language modeling, in my opinion, if it was trained on so many data, it, would, it shouldn't be so much of a problem, right? Um, so again, it achieves the really good state of the art result in terms of perplexity. So the lower the value is, the better the model performs. Obviously the biggest one performed the best. In terms of accuracy, it's 63%, which is still state of the art. Um, the next data set they use is CBT, which is um, children book tests. And let me show you examples of this. Obviously, if you want to look more into these data sets, I highly recommend seeing the Hugging Face website. They've got all of these NLP data sets open and with where you can preview how it looks like. So CBT is testing the ability to understand the language and they get two options. So one is you need to predict the common noun. The other one is the name entity. So again, we pass the text, the question about it. It's not really a question. It's more like the text and the blank space. It's got 10 options to predict from and it choose the one, right? In this data set also, it achieves the state of the art result. Um, the next data set, uh, the other data sets is Wikitext, where you basically got the articles from Wikipedia and you try to predict the next word. Again, state of the art. PTB, um, I think it's Wall Street journals, when they also predict the next word. NWIC is a, N, is a compressing data, which I actually don't know much about. And again, you got the Wikitext, um, where they got Wikitext, when again, you need to predict the next word in the articles. 
I mean, as you can see, these tasks are language modeling tasks. So they're based on predicting the next words in the sentence. Again, I think like if you've trained it on such a uh, huge data set, it's so much, it should be normal that this uh, model will learn learns the language and should, for me it should even perform better that's my opinion so this is the language modeling task now we can move to the tasks that are not related so much to the language modeling like vinogran schema challenge so they actually improve the state of the art accuracy by seven percent and i think that it proves that the model learns more than just generating the text but also understanding the text and vinograd schema is testing the common sense reasoning so that's what, for me, it's more impressive than actually generating a new text. So the simple example is a sentence, the trophy would not fit in a brown suitcase because it was too big. What was too big? So in this task, so you need to understand what was too big, right? So you need to understand the sentence and yeah, it achieved 70% accuracy, beat the state of the year result. And I think it's more, uh, it's more interesting than just language modeling tasks. And I think that's that's really good results. The next was reading comprehension with uh, on Coca data set. The most important is that it matches or exceeds the performance of three out of four baseline system without using the fine tuning on manually collected examples. So that's really shows the, I think the potential of the zero shots. So the next task they did is summarization, which um, funny enough, they, they actually add the TLDR at the end of the article, they wanted to summarize and they, the model was summarizing and the model then performed the generation of the text. That was really interesting. And some of the results are quite good. You can see them on the, I'll link it down below in the OpenAI blog, blog post. And yeah, but uh, there's also so show the limitation of the model. So they often focus, so the model often focus on the recent content from the article or confuse specific details such as how many cars were involved in the crash or whether a logo was on a hat or shirt. So it still is not consistent with its prediction and it can formulate the really long-term dependencies. They also, it's really cool about it that it points out the limitation and I'm gonna explain later why I think they points out all of them here. They also show the potential in translation. They use the VMT 14 data set, uh, English French translation data set, and GP2 achieved five blue points. And let me show you what the blue points are. That's the Google metrics about the blue. And as you can see uh, about the blow, sc blow score, the, the five points is means that they're almost useless. So still, they, they show that it, it can perform some of the translation, but it's not useful in any way. Uh, to give you a comparison, the actual state of the art result is 33.5. So they also tested on a question answering um, data set, which is factoid start questions. They show them some of them here. And like the, the one of the question is who wrote the book, The Origin of Species? And the generated answer is Charles Darwin. And it's interesting. They show some of the examples here. Essentially, the, the important thing you can see there is that the model is able to memorize some of this stuff. So essentially, I think the paper itself is about showing the limitations of the model to actually prove that if we can build bigger models, we can achieve much better results. So they show this promising, uh, some of the obviously state of the art in language modeling, but on this other data set to show, you know, there's a promising results. If we scale it even bigger, we can achieve much better results. And I think that's the whole point of the paper that we built even the 1.5 billion model, but we can be uh, build something bigger and we can gather more data set and it's gonna be even perform better. So they also show here in this um, graph that the model is underfitting and the model is underfitting. It hasn't saturated anywhere yet. So they show that we can train the longer, we can train bigger models and I think and even at the end, they state that the zero shot performance of GPT is still far from usable, but it's just show the promising results. And 
Yeah, I think that's the whole point of the paper. That's why they evaluated in a zero shot configuration, just to show you that we can generalize really good. But still, there's luck in a lot of stuff. And I think when we're gonna get to GPT-3, we're gonna see exactly if it work out or not. Um, the other thing I want to talk about also in this video is the safety concerns. So openly, I didn't release the whole model at, at the start. They didn't release the code and they did, didn't release the data set and they did, didn't, didn't release the pre-trained weight. So why they did it? I think the whole community was kind of pissed off about it. Because if you look at the community of AI, uh, everyone is just sharing their work and it was normal that you share your work to the others. And in this case, because of the safety reason, they didn't release the model. I want to play a bit of devil's advocate in this case and explain. I don't know the reason why they do it exactly, because obviously I'm not working in no open AI, but I can, but I want to point out the positive aspects of it. So why GPT-2 can be dangerous. So I think the real danger that uh, GPT-2 could make was, was introducing undetectable bots. So on the most of the social media platforms, bots were detected by the content they create and how they interact with the others. So in this case, when GP2 is able to create really a uh, human-like blog post, and also because of the content is human-like, the other humans can get into meaningful uh, interaction with those bots. So this is a kind of verification for them. They can, they are not detected as bots. So then these bots are not label it as a bots on the platforms, they can actually manipulate the voting. So whoever owns these bots can manipulate these, right? And we think that the user are voting, but this is the like companies that are voting in these polls. So to give you an example, apparently some of the voting polls were manipulated during the Brexit, or some of them also manipulated lately with Elon Musk buying a Twitter. So this is a huge problem. And what OpenAI did by not releasing the model at the start they just bought some time to the bigger companies and just say to them, you need to look at this technology because it's sooner or later, someone's gonna collect this data, build a model, train it, and you're gonna somehow protect it, protect against it. So in this case, the companies can create new tools to kind of fight against it. So that's one positive thing. The other one is it create the precedence that you really take care of the safety and I think it's important when we're going to create more and more advanced models in the future. And I think it points out for the other companies to look on the safety concerns even more. I think it's going to, it's it just set out a good precedence for the future and a good practice for the future. So that's the positive aspects of not releasing the model. At the end of the day, it's kind of also people were disappointed because that was the whole point of the community of AI to open source the results. But yeah. Let me know in the comment what you think about it. And that's about it for this video. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you understand the GPT-2. And in the next video, we're gonna try to look at the GPT-3 and see if the hype is real. If you enjoy that kind of videos, hit the like and subscribe button. And yeah, see you in the next video. Bye.